Well, welcome to Thrive Church. We are so happy to have you here with us. We also want to wish you a very happy 4th of July as well. I know so much is going to be going on this weekend celebrating that, but we are so glad that you've chosen to be with us today, whether you are in person at Torrington, Terryville, New Britain, or online. We welcome you. My name is Judah Thomas, and I'm the lead pastor here of Thrive Church, and we are in a series called No Nerves of steel, nerves of steel. And, and you know, there's a lot of things in life that take nerves of steel. Maybe doing an adventure sport, maybe trying something new, maybe going to a, a new school or a new job or venturing out into a relationship or a business deal. There's things that require us having nerves of steel. And throughout this series, we've been studying the life of a prophet named Daniel. Daniel is from the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, long before Jesus came onto the scene, and he was a prophet. And, and we're studying his life, and if there's a common theme throughout it, is that we need to have boldness to stand for what is right. In this world that we're living in, it seems like so many people are trying to say what's wrong is right and what's right is wrong and all of these things, but I believe that we need to have the boldness to stand for what is right. In your notes, if you're taking them, we should stand for what is right regardless of the consequences. Regardless of the consequences, we need to stand for God. We need to stand for what is right. So we've been studying this life of Daniel, and if there's one thing that he did, he always stood for what he believed, and he always stood strong because he had nerves of steel. But throughout this series as well, if you've been listening and following along, we know that this story has also not just been about Daniel, but it's also been about King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, also known as Nebuchadnezzar the Great, was the, uh, the second king, but kind of the main king of Babylon for a long time. And it seems like, as we talked about last week, that he kind of turned his life over to God in the later years of his life. You know, he went through some very humbling experiences. He went through some, some kind of mental disorder where he thought he was an animal, and he lived with the wildlife for a while. But throughout all of this, he reigned for 43 years. This was the longest reign of any Babylonian king. He was the greatest king of the Babylonian empire. But as all good things come to an end, Nebuchadnezzar died. And then over the next eight years, the kingdom fell into these tumultuous times. Over the next six to eight years, the kingdom changed hands multiple times. There was sons and sons-in-law and plots and assassinations. And it's like all of these things. And everyone's trying to, to gain the throne and, and, and in fact, some of these things, it turned hands so fast that historical records kind of get confusing because, you know, the different places that people were, by the time they'd hear the news, somebody else was already there. And, and it got really confusing, but this led ultimately to a king, and his name was Labashai Marduk, okay? It's not in your notes, it's not even in the Bible, but this was the king, Lab Labashai Marduk. He became the king, and he was a young king. We don't know how old, maybe he was a child, maybe he was a teenager, but he was a very young king, and he was only on the throne for maybe one to three months somewhere in there, until there was an assassination plot where he was literally beaten to death. And, and this was probably, this assassination was led by a man named, most likely uh, by a man named Belshazzar. And Belshazzar kind of led this assassination. He was known as a tyrant. He was known for hating the Jews and he oppressed them anytime he got. And here he was, you know, uh, heading up an assassination plot to claim the throne. And this is who we'll be reading about in this upcoming chapter. And, and for years, though, this story that we read has caused so much controversy because historic, uh, historians have said, well, this proves that the Bible is not true because there was no King Belshazzar. 
And so because of that, there was no king. They knew that the, the next king that really reigned on the throne, his name was Nabonidus. And Nabonidus was the next king. And so therefore the Bible must be wrong because Belshazzar was never the king of Babylon. However, however, we need to be very careful when we begin to criticize the validity of God's word because it's been my experience that if something tends to contradict the scripture, it's only because we don't have enough evidence yet. And when the evidence comes to light, it proves that what scripture says is true. And that did happen when they found something called the Nabonidus cylinders. And in these Nabonidus cylinders, it was writings on this sphere, uh, the, the cylinder shape, and Nabonidus mentions his son, whose name was Belshazzar, who happened to be a co-regent of Babylon. So Belshazzar kind of made this claim on the throne, but he couldn't be king while his father was still alive. So instead of becoming king himself, then he made Nabonidus, his dad, the king. But his dad, Nabonidus, was old, and he assumed that the reign would be very brief, and Belshazzar expected to inherit the throne in only a few years. Nabonidus, he becomes king, but he kind of second guesses this. And even in his writings, we see that he questions the validity of him becoming king. It's almost as if he doesn't even want to be king. And so he becomes very interested in Arabia and he ends up moving to Arabia for 10 years. Over a decade, he moves there and guess who he leaves behind? He leaves behind his son Belshazzar as the regent, as the sitting acting king of Babylon. History has now validated the Bible, or the re in reality, it's only said what we knew to be true all along. So we will be studying about King Belshazzar here in Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. It says, many years later, Okay, so let's just stop there. Many years later, later after what? If you were here last week, maybe you remember. If not, I'll recap. There was a story of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he had a dream about a tree, and a tree getting chopped down. And, and this dream troubled him, and Daniel gave the interpretation, saying that Nebuchadnezzar would uh, kind of turn into like this animal kind of being, and he would, he would go and he would you know, live with the, with the livestock, and he would eat grass for a period of, uh, of maybe around seven years and then he would come back and reclaim his throne he would come to his senses and as he did that he also acknowledged that the Lord of heaven is the one true living God Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by this experience and and eventually he passed away and here is where we pick up many years later so this is many years after that happened King Belshazzar gave a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles and he drank wine with them Maybe this sounds familiar to you, right? Because Nabonidus, the true king of Babylon, was away in Arabia, and whenever the parents are away, what do the kids do? They start throwing parties in the place. And this was the party to end all parties. A thousand people were in attendance, a thousand of his nobles, and he's drinking wine with them. They're having a good time. And while Belshazzar was drinking wine in verse two, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So there was these uh, uh, articles, these cups, and, and, and th these cups were, were, uh, were brought um, by Nebuchadnezzar. They were most likely, they were made by King Solomon, and he brings all of these in, brings them in, uh, where was I, verse two, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. Now, let me just pause to say this. What isn't mentioned here, but what we know historically, is at this very moment, the Medes and the Persians were laying siege to Babylon. So they had surrounded, I don't know exactly for how long, but they had been um, in siege uh, and they were surrounded around Babylon. But, but this just kind of shows how cocky these guys were. See, the walls of Babylon were miles and miles long. Some say up to 300 foot tall, 80 feet wide. These were impenetrable walls and, and, and Babylon had everything it needed within the walls. Normally when you lay siege, 
You lay siege so they couldn't get food and provisions, but what the kings of Babylon had done was they had actually rerouted the Euphrates River to run underneath the walls and right through the center of the city. So they had fresh water, they had irrigation for their crops, they had all of these things, they had the perfect situation. So they are under attack essentially by the Medes and Persians and what is Belshazzar doing? He's throwing the party to end all parties. They are having a great time. And so here they are, they bring in from these cups uh, and, and they're all getting drunk with the, with the wine from these cups. He says, verse three, so they brought these gold cups from the temple, the house of the God in Jerusalem. And the kings and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. Now this wasn't just that they were simply having a drink, but it says here in verse four, while they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. It's like as they were, as they were drinking, it was like, you know, ha having toasts, and they're having these toasts to the different gods. Hey, let's have a glass for, for you know, uh, our god Baal or our god Nabu or, or whatever. And so they were worshiping these gods, and they were using these cups as part of their worship of these false gods. These were cups, again, that were likely commissioned by King Solomon. They were stored in the temple, and then they were stolen by Nebuchadnezzar, but these were set apart to be used to worship the one true God. And now they're being used to praise idols, idols made out of wood and gold and stone. If anyone was trying to stir up the wrath of God, Belshazzar was doing that. He was, he was enraging the God of heaven. See, do we ever use what is God's in order to serve our own flesh? You know, probably the most holy thing that we have set apart is our own bodies. Scripture says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and yet so often we use our own body, our temple, for our own personal pleasure for sexual sin and drunkenness and addiction and all of these other things. In much the same way as King Belshazzar was bringing in these vessels that were dedicated to God and say, we are gonna use these not to worship God, but to worship all of these other idols that we worship. Verse five of Daniel five says, suddenly they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace. Now, I mean, that, this must have been wild. Like, like here they are, they're all drinking, they're all having a good time, and a human hand just kind of flies in there and starts writing. Now, now I, I won't ask you to raise your hands about any of this, but perhaps you've been in an altered state of consciousness before, under the influence, and maybe have saw things that you weren't quite sure if they were real or not. And so here comes this hand, and everybody's probably kind of chuckling, oh, yeah, yeah, wow, look at this hand, and they're all just kind of enjoying the, the, uh, the sensations of inebriation as they're watching this hand, and it comes in, and it starts to write near the lampstand. I think it's interesting it was near the lampstand so that everyone could see. It was illuminated, and the king himself saw the hand as it wrote. Now, I don't know exactly how it did it, but it wrote in the plaster walls, and I can just imagine kind of like this scratching sound. Like, like you ever hear that, that sound of, of fingernails on a chalkboard? Like, it's just this, this, this kind of skin-crawling sound, and I imagine it's a sound like that. The party just stops, and everybody's like kind of cringing as his hand is writing on the wall. And it says, the king and his face turned pale with fright. And the blood drained out of his face. Has your face ever done that? Maybe you get caught doing something you shouldn't do. Maybe you're afraid of something. That's what happened here. It's just his face turned pale with fright and his knees knocked together. Like he's like shaking in his boots, literally. His knees knocked together in fear and his legs gave way beneath him. He was a mess, right? I mean, he's got, you know, all of this stuff going on. He's got this whole party. This hand comes and starts writing on the wall and he just loses it. He loses it. This was the finger of God coming to write. This was not some magic trick. This was the finger of God, the same finger that etched in stone the 10 commandments. God had a message for King Belshazzar and for the Babylonian empire. Well, King Belshazzar was caught and now he's terrified. His knees are knocking, he's trembling and he sees the handwriting on the, on the wall 
And, and if you've ever heard that expression before, it, it came from there. Like, oh, we just saw the handwriting on the wall. We saw the writing on the wall. You heard that expression? That comes from this right here. And generally what it means is it means that you see evidence of something bad about to happen. Right, it's like maybe maybe you're in a relationship and, and things aren't going there very well and, and you're not getting along and, and, and you're kind of like, well, you know what, I kind of see the handwriting on the wall or maybe, maybe you have a, a job and, and your boss keeps coming down on you for some things and you say, well, I just kind of see the handwriting on the wall, like I might be fired soon or, or maybe you know, in, in the uh, financial industry, you know, you're investing, you're doing things, but, but it just seems like things aren't going well. We see the handwriting on the wall. It's saying, I see something that's evidence of of something bad that is about to happen, and that is exactly what happens when he literally sees a hand writing on the wall. So what does he do? Does the same thing King Nebuchadnezzar used to do. He calls his astrologers, his enchanters, and his fortune tellers to come. And he says, come and tell me what the writing on the wall means. And there is a reward for anyone who can tell me what the writing means. I will give you royal robes to wear. I'll give you a golden necklace and you will be made the third highest in the kingdom. Again, this is a clue that helps us to understand the Bible actually knew what it was talking about because we see that this was his father and him and then this person would be the third in command over this kingdom. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't tell him what it meant. They had absolutely no clue. They came in and they see the writing and they're like, we have no clue. In fact, we're terrified. And that made the king even more terrified as well. And so here they are panicking. They don't know what to do. There's all these people in there. That party died so fast. And then comes in the queen mother. Now we don't exactly know her relationship to Belshazzar here. Um, she was likely an older uh, queen, possibly his mother-in-law, and very likely it was even King Nebuchadnezzar's own daughter. So she's there because she, we know that she has some history of the kingdom and how it operated in the past. And she comes in and tells Belshazzar, she says, do not be afraid because there is a man in this kingdom who is full of the spirit of God. And this man he has insight and understanding and the wisdom of the gods. She was referring, of course, to Daniel. She says, Nebuchadnezzar made him the chief over all the magicians, over all the enchanters, over all the astrologers and the fortune tellers. So then he calls in this man, Belteshazzar. It gets a little confusing here because it sounds very similar to Belshazzar. Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, the one with the T is actually Daniel. This is Daniel's Babylonian name. Daniel's Hebrew name was Daniel, but they were calling him Belteshazzar. They said, come on in here, come on in here. And so she says that he has the ability to interpret dreams and explain riddles, solve problems, and he can tell you what the writing means. Why? Because he had the spirit of God inside of him. In your notes, God gives insight and wisdom to those who honor him. Daniel lived a life of honoring God. He honored God in everything that he did, and as a result, God gave him wisdom and insight. So Daniel is called in, and King Belshazzar says, hey, Belteshazzar, hey, Daniel, I've heard of you. Yeah, you heard of him five minutes ago. Like, that was the first he heard of him. He's like, I've heard of you. I've heard of you. And, you know, no one can interpret the writing on this wall, but maybe you can. And if you can, have I got a deal for you. I'm gonna give you the royal robes. I'm gonna give you a, a golden chain. I'm gonna make you the third in command in the entire kingdom. And then Daniel begins to address him. I think it's kind of funny, though, because when you read this, it seems as if Daniel's tone has changed. You know, it's different from when he would talk to Nebuchadnezzar. When he talked to Nebuchadnezzar, it, there was almost this, this loving bond between the two of them. In fact, in the last time when, when he interpreted a dream, it was very negative, and, and Daniel said, I wish this dream was, was for your enemies and not for you. But we know that, that Daniel would always say what God told him to say because he had nerves of steel. And at this point, like most likely he's in his 60s, so he kind of doesn't give a rip anymore. You know, he's like, I kind of don't care what you think of me. I'm just gonna 
tell you. But he was friends with Nebuchadnezzar, but he doesn't really seem to like this guy that much. Maybe because he saw the violence that he used in overthrowing the kingdom. Maybe because he saw how he dishonored God by taking in these cups and using them for idol worship. Maybe because he saw how evil this man truly was. So Belshazzar says, hey, I'm gonna give you some new clothes and I'm gonna give you, you know, a golden chain. And, and, and you know, Daniel says, he says, keep your gifts and give it to somebody else. He's like, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want it. I want nothing to do with these gifts that you wanna to give to me. And then he goes on to say that God gave power and glory and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. And God made Nebuchadnezzar so great that all the nations of the world feared him. And he killed who he needed to kill and he spared those he wanted to spare. And he honored the people he wanted to honor and he disgraced those who offended him. But in all of his power, he became arrogant and proud. And then he was brought low and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from society and he lived like an animal. He had the mind like an animal and he lived among the livestock and he ate grass like a cow and, and he was drenched with the dew from the sky until he learned that God rules over kingdoms and appoints anyone he desires to rule. And so he looks at Belshazzar and says, you're his successor and you knew this story you knew that he was brought low so that he could learn humility, but you did not humble yourself. And you proudly defy God, and you even went and grabbed the cups from the temple of the Lord, and you're using them. You're using them to praise your gods that can't even see or hear or talk or do anything. You have not honored God. So God sent the hand to write this message down because in your notes, God will bring low those who defy him. Seems like in our country, in our world, it has become a popular thing to defy God, to defy God with our views, with our morals, with our politics. We defy God. God will bring low those who defy him. And, and you know the crazy thing? Daniel hasn't even got to the interpretation yet. Like, 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 like at this point, he's just kind of on a rant. He's like, yeah, I'll tell you the writing, but let, let me just air a few things first. You know what? You are proud. You are nothing like Nebuchadnezzar. I'm just gonna vent for a minute and then we'll get to the writing on the wall. So here we go in Daniel 5, 25. This is the message that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is what these words meant. See, these were Aramaic words. The Babylonians didn't understand the Aramaic uh, uh, you know, language, and so Daniel came and he could see them. Each word had a meaning, but then there was a sentence that God gave him for each of these words. Mene, which is actually repeated, and it's repeated for emphasis, it means numbered. And Daniel says, this is what that means. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You've been weighed on the balances and you have not measured up. Parison, which means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes and a gold chain was hung around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler of the kingdom. See, Belshazzar was proud. He was violent, he did what he wanted to do. He was powerful, but he did not measure up to God's standards. See, God says, I'm weighing you, Belshazzar, I'm weighing you. You know, he's like, I'm gonna put you on my scale and see where you stand. You think you're so powerful? You think you have so much money and popularity and fame and all this? I am gonna weigh you and I weighed you and found that you are severely lacking that you severely do not measure up. You know what it's like? It's like, like when you're a kid and you go to an amusement park. Remember that when you're a kid? You go to an amusement park and they got all the great roller coasters, the ones that go upside down, the ones that go really fast, all the great roller coasters. And you go up like, I don't wanna go on that roller coaster, the one that spins upside down 18 times and makes you throw up at the end. I'm gonna go on that roller coaster. And you go up and then there's the guy, the guy with the stick, right? 
the stick, and the stick's like a reverse L shape. He says, okay, we got to see if you're tall enough to ride, and you go up to that stick, and, and you're on your tiptoes, and you're kind of puffing up your hair a little bit, trying with all that you are to reach the top of the stick, but then the attendant says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you just don't measure up, kid. Just not tall enough. You, 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 there, there's something that, that's lacking here, and that lack is height, and you're not allowed to go on the ride. God is saying, hey, Belshazzar, I have weighed you, and you are wanting. You do not measure up. Through the debauchery of his life, through the pride that he uh, just lived in, through this total disregard for the most high God, through the evil in his heart, God saw that he was lacking. How about in your life? How about in your life? If God weighed you right now on his celestial scale, would you be found wanting? Would you measure up? If God weighed your family, would it be found wanting? If God weighed our country, hmm, would it be found wanting? Or would he say, you know what? You just don't measure up. You don't measure up to my standards. See, this is all about being men and women of honor, being men and women who love and serve God, who have integrity. In your notes, God works through people with integrity, people who are the same behind closed doors as they are in front of people, people who are not living the life of a hypocrite, people who are not fake, people who are not consumed by pride and ego and arrogance. See, God works through people like Daniel, people who have integrity, who have nerves of steel. It says in Proverbs 21, verse two, a person may think they're right in their own eyes, a person may think their own ways are right, sorry. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. God is the one who weighs your heart, who weighs your motives. Have you ever done the right thing with the wrong motive? Maybe you've helped somebody, maybe you've done something for someone, but you really only did it because you wanted to look good for someone else. You really only did it because you wanted to, to appear a certain way. See, God weighs the heart, God weighs the motives, and God weighed Belshazzar's heart and found it severely lacking. So how is your heart? Are you more concerned with the world? Are you more concerned with power and money and pride and politics and fame and education, or are you walking humbly before the Lord? God wants us to walk in humility because in your notes, humility attracts God's honor. It attracts God's honor when we walk humbly before the Lord. It says in Daniel chapter five, verse 30, it says that very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. This is a pivotal moment. This is a pivotal moment in the Babylonian Empire because it was conquered by Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. Now Cyrus was the overarching ruler and Darius was the ruler of the Medes and they kind of co-reigned together. Now let's reflect back to the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, the dream of a statue of a man and the head was made of gold and the chest and arms were made out of silver. And this was symbolic of a new kingdom that would come, a kingdom with two sides, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the kingdom ruled by Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. And see, Belshazzar did not realize that while he was partying, his city was being invaded. He thought he had it all figured out. He was so proud. His kingdom was impenetrable, but he forgot one thing. See, the Medes and the Persians, they, as they laid in siege around the city, they realized that the Euphrates River was going through the center of the city. So you know what they did? They dammed up the Euphrates River and they diverted it to a marshland and it allowed their soldiers to go under the walls and come in and conquer Babylon without even a battle. Because of pride. Pride. They'll never get us. I'm bigger than God. I'm better than God. He didn't realize that while he was partying, God was bringing a sentence to him. 
and that began the Medo-Persian rule. This was a rule that had been prophesied by Jeremiah and had been prophesied by Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah, hundreds of years before this happened, not only predicted that it would happen, but predicted the name of the conquering king being Cyrus. And he was a key person. You know why he was a key person? Because he was the one who ultimately liberated the children of God, the Jewish people, to go back to their homeland. And he authorized the rebuilding of the temple. And all throughout this, in the early years of Daniel, there was another prophet, and his name was Jeremiah. And he said the famous quote, he says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans that are good, plans to give you future, plans to give you hope. And here, that plan was built beginning to come to pass because God weighed a king and found him wanting, but he was using that as a way to deliver his people back. Now, when God weighs you and me, do we fall short? If the truth be made known, we have all sinned and we all fall short of God's standard. None of us measure up. None of us are big enough to go on the ride. None of us have enough weight on our own, but we need the saving grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, they were looking forward to the promise of a Messiah. We have the opportunity to look back and see the king who came, the king who died on a cross, the resurrected king, the one whom all other kings will one day bow, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the name above all names and all of us. We need to come humbly before him. We need to have nerves of steel, not bowing to the pressures of this world, but bowing to the one and only true king, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. So Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your power. And Father, we just ask you to help us not to be like Belshazzar who was full of pride, full of evil and wickedness. But let us walk in humility. Let us walk in integrity and therefore you will bring us honor. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord, don't let another day go by. God is inviting you now into his family. He says, anyone who calls on my name will be saved. Won't you call on the name of Jesus? If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you say with your mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord, then you'll be saved. Won't you call on his name and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. God, we ask you to give us the nerves of steel like Daniel had. Give us boldness to stand in the face of corruption and evil that is going on in our world even now as we speak. Let us stand boldly and proclaim the name of Jesus, that we are representatives of your kingdom. And we thank you for your goodness. Let us put aside the pride that so easily creeps into our life the pride that we justify, the pride that we say, it's okay that I feel that way. Lord, we ask you to put that to death, the pride in our life, and let us walk humbly before you, our Lord and our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.